Uh, hello and welcome to everyone who's watching and listening. I'm Sophia Sue, one of the co-founders of Undisciplining the Victorian Classroom. Um, and if you're new to our Zoom cast, this is one of the forms of content that we're generating for our project. Um, and it's meant to be a space to stage conversations with one another in order for us to think together uh, about our classroom practices and about our processes of learning and unlearning as teachers. Um, as with all of our content on UVC, our goal is to grow and learn together as a community of scholars, especially as we take up the challenge um, of moving you know, beyond the boundaries of our field um, and, and beyond the boundaries of our training to address issues of race and racism in our field and in our classrooms. Um, so this is a second Zoom cast in our collaboration series, which highlights successful collaborations within Victorian studies and beyond um, in order to uncover strategies and models that we might employ to broaden the scope and impact of our work. Uh, as you can see, I'm joined today by five individuals. So first we have uh, Meng Liu Gao, who's Assistant Professor of Victorian Literature at the University of Denver. Next, we have Wai Yi Lo, who's Assistant Professor of World Literature at Kanagawa University in Yokohama, Japan. Then we have Hyungji Park, who's Professor of English Literature at Yonsei University in Seoul, Korea. We also have Jessica Valdez, who's Lecturer in Literature at the Long Global 19th Century at the University of East Anglia. She's also formerly um, Assistant Professor at the University of Hong Kong. And last but not least, we have Ray Yan, who is an Assistant Professor of British Literature from 1830 to 1900 at the University of Florida. Uh, and together today, we'll be discussing our processes in developing the lesson plan cluster on trans imperial networks and East Asia published on the UBC website. Um, as we know, in our intro to the cluster, our lesson plans explore the figurative and historical centrality of East Asia to Victorian studies. Um, so I thought that we could get our conversation started by just kind of discussing how we all got involved in this project. Um, so I figure maybe I can kind of take up that question first, since I um, kind of had the initial idea for this particular lesson plan cluster. Um, so I came up with the idea, you know, in, in late 2021, um, kind of thinking through how I might be able to respond to anti-Asian prejudice and violence during you know, the, the pandemic, during COVID. Um, you know, the Atlantic or I'm sorry, the Atlanta shootings recently occurred then. Um, we're, of course, still in the middle of a lot of anti-Asian violence. Just, you know, a month ago, we had the um, Monterey Park shootings, um, had the um, Half Moon Bay shootings. And so we're still in this very kind of um, anti-Asian kind of moment in history. But I was thinking back then, you know, how might I respond to this particular moment? My first idea is always, you know, maybe there's something that I can do with my teaching. Um, is there something that I can learn about that I can kind of share with my students and have these conversations with them? And so, you know, um, I started looking for collaborators because this is certainly not my field of study. And so I came across Jessica's of virtual analysis panels on Victoria Studies, Asia and the Pacific, and kind of watching all the papers, all the presenters, I was just really inspired by all of their work. And um, I reached out to Jessica just to see if there was something that we could do together. Yeah, I can jump in here and talk a little bit about that virtual event or series of events that I organized. So that was the year of the, of the unconferences, I guess, uh, because of COVID. And I had organized a three-part series of different papers to, first of all, focus on um, Asia and, and, and East Asia in relationship to Victorian studies, but also to try to accommodate different time zones, because at the time I was based in the University of Hong Kong, and a lot of the events organized online at the time were only in U.S. or European time zones, so it was quite prohibitive for my students and for other colleagues and, and academics in the area to get involved. Um, so the, the panel series that I organized um, was not just to diversify the material um, and, and foreground research done in this area, but also to allow for more collaboration across time zones 
um, and try to also decenter U.S. academia in order to open up uh, those of us working in, in other places across the world. And in fact, uh, that's how I got to know uh, Menglu, Ray, and Yi, who participated and gave wonderful papers at that time. Some of us knew each other from Jessica's um, roundtable event, but early on in our discussion, we decided we needed to have a Korean specialist on the team because Korea is such an important location when talking about the history of China and Japan in the long 19th century. The problem was we didn't know anyone who would be suitable. So I asked a Korean friend of mine if she knew anyone specializing in Victorian studies in South Korea. And that's how we got to know Hyunji. Yes, I'm wondering if we can um, now talk about like who do we imagine the audience is for these materials. We've clearly, um, you know, just talked about how we wanted to at least shape the people involved, but like who else might we see as being kind of part of these materials and in, in using them. Uh, so I can jump in. Um, our goal as a group was to on um, discipline and open lab, lab Victorian studies. Um, so we uh, mainly targeted Victorianists, uh, especially uh, Victorianists in the U.S. and in the U.K. Um, while on disciplining is um, something that Victorians have recently started to pay attention to. Um, but the same method of undisciplining may have become a common practice or even um, a tradition for uh, East Asian studies or non-Western literary studies in the uh, English speaking world. Um, for example, modern Chinese literary studies often uh, considers Chinese literature's uh, connection with uh, Western literary traditions. Um, so I just wanna highlight that uh, what we wanted to do here is uh, the other way around. That is, um, by opening up Victorian studies to East Asia, we provide materials and approaches for uh, Victorianists to think about uh, and to teach how East Asia or the non-West in general played an important role uh, in shaping the Victorian world. So uh, we really consider Victorian as our main audience here. Oh. I would say that even though we're targeting other Victorias, especially in the US and the UK, um, some of us, many of us don't teach in those contexts. So we also did have multiple conversations about the specific student populations we wish to serve and what our goals were for kind of meeting like a very diverse, very different institutional pedagogical needs. We shared a lot about our own teaching, um, our students and their needs and what we wanted. We all have very different class sizes from small seminars to large classes. Um, all our student populations are actually quite different as we teach um, some what are sometimes called non-traditional students, um, though I feel like all students are kind of non-traditional in their own way. Uh, many of us don't teach to English majors specifically, um, but offer opportunities to engage Victorian literature as part of larger literature courses or in different kind of general education courses. So with the idea of being able to scale up or down, make our materials accessible to students of very, very different backgrounds and interests, we hope that our materials can be used across most pedagogical institutions and populations. To add on to what Ray has just said, um, I teach in Japan and Hyungji teaches in South Korea. Um, students in non-Anglophone countries generally have lower um, English language proficiency. So bearing this in mind, uh, we have designed our lesson plans to be used in a very flexible way, um, to be used differently by different people teaching in different contexts. Yeah, I mean, um, as Ray said, right, like we, we talked a lot about our teaching and just to understand like where we're coming from in, in creating these lesson plans. Um, so I'm wondering if we can now shift a little bit to thinking more about like, you know, once we had those conversations, how did we imagine people using the, the lesson plans that we created given you know, the way that we designed them? 
I can jump in here. Um, you know, you may notice all our lesson plans are pretty modular. So please take and use whatever you need. Um, we all chose, you know, shorter materials as well as non-literary materials that you can just kind of cut and paste into your own syllabi as needed. We all personally know how difficult it is to start working in a new field, and we didn't want to overwhelm our colleagues or students. We wanted to be able to do more with less, you know, and that's because we have uh strong ethical and pedagogical philosophical ideas about how teaching Victorian studies should work in the next few decades and years. And that comes from work from peers such as Travis Lau, who speaks a lot about, you know, how our discipline um, should be viewed from a disability studies perspective, as well as writers on reimagining Victorian studies, such as Erica Kanesaka Kalne, who asks, who asks us as a field how we may pursue Victorian studies to heal and be healed. So, you know, please view our materials as not just adding to what you're already doing, but hopefully changing the way that you work, um, recognizing the limits of your body, mind, your attention, your time. Um, and thinking about ethics in another context, we wanted to recall the position of the original undisciplining the Victorian studies movement to contribute again, as Menlu has mentioned, to other fields and not just take from them. We continually had conversations about other communities of teacher scholars who might make use of our materials. And we want these resources to be useful for teacher scholars in empire and trans-imperialism, rural literature, Asian literature, British Asian studies, and more. And we want feedback from other scholars in other fields. So if you're watching this, please reach out to us and let us know what you think. Um, and this may also explain why we have sometimes rather unconventional pairings of materials, such as my own suggestion and my lesson uh, plan to try reading three formerly experimental texts about Mad Men, Dickens's um, uh, A Mad Men's Manuscript from Pickwick's paper, Nikolai Gogol's Diary of a Mad Men, Lucian's Mad Men's Diary. Um, you'll see a lot of very interesting pairings in, in our lesson plans. And I'll just briefly add on to what Ray has already said. Um, I, I like what Y.E. said earlier that a lot of other traditions of literary study already have to essentially what we're calling undiscipline themselves already have to be attentive to the traditions of Western literature. And in a sense, that's kind of how we're reorienting our approach to Victorian literature and Victorian studies, um, not simply to focus on um, what is traditionally viewed as Victorian studies in a silo, but rather open up to to other um, areas of study. And in fact, we are emphasizing um, the need and trying to facilitate the use of resources and fields that are traditionally outside our area of study, including um, area studies and China studies. Um, in fact, in my own uh, lesson plan, I drew upon work by historian Edley Wong and Beth Williams, who both work in uh, not just history, but also Black studies and Asian American studies. Um, also, uh, my lesson plan encourages the use of material objects as well and, and the use of museums. Um, and one possibility for uh, a, a modular approach to my lesson plan is to take the idea for a, an assignment or assessment where students go to a museum or go to a virtual museum and look at the kind of narratives that museums are constructing around material objects. Um, yeah, and, and this is something that I've also done um, in collaboration with Dr. Clara Dawson at University of Manchester when I was at the University of Hong Kong. Yeah, we've been talking about um, the ways in which we imagined how people would use our resources. And I decided to um, actually put theory into practice and to teach the lesson plans that, that we developed. So um, in the semester, our cluster went live in fall 2022, maybe in September or October. And in that very semester, I actually taught a graduate course um, uh, where we went through my lesson plan, and that was actually our entire semester. I mean, I scaffolded it, it with some theoretical background um, and uh, encouraged, well, actually coerced um, my students to also look at the lesson plans of everybody else in the Zoom um, so that they sort of went horizontally and looked at the other lesson plans. And then we went into a deep dive into my own lesson plan um, and the semester's final project for the students was for each of the students to come up with their mini version of what we did, their own mini lesson plan of picking one text or one item of interest um, and to do their own research and to sort of um, package it for uh, future um, uh, Victorianists or teachers or packages as a, as a resource for, for future teaching. And um, 
so they picked a text that demonstrates Korea's relationship with the West in late 19th or early 20th century Korea. And they picked um, things according to their own background. So I had a French student talk about the first translation of a French novel into Korea. I had a student who's interested in astronomy go off on um, sort of early Korean astronomy. It was really fascinating. Another student did uh, missionary periodicals of the time period or sort of decorative arts and furniture, et cetera. It was, it was really interesting um, to have students pursue this further. In some ways it made, uh, it reminded us, it made us uh, more aware that what we put out there is not like a fixed or final thing. I don't think that we, any of us think this, this is the definitive answer. I think that we think this is a living, organically moving organism. In some ways we're just proposing ideas um, that you can take away, but we're also hoping to propose these as structures um, to think uh, about. Uh, and, and I did this in my graduate class because um, I thought that since I teach in Seoul, I thought it would be really useful for my students to have, you know, for the next generation of scholars, right, um, Victorianists, to have this kind of experience that um, uh, connecting their location, uh, their lives in Korea, Korean history to Victorian studies is actually something um, meaningful and what we think of as the future of um, uh, academic work. And we expect that these student projects will probably be added to UBC in the next uh, in the next month or so. So maybe you can look them up soon. No, I love that. Thanks for sharing that. Um, I love this idea of, yeah, I mean, of course, like our lesson plans are kind of like breadcrumbs, right? That we, we just laid out there to see what else might, happen you know once these are out there and, and it's really great to hear about how your students are um taking them expanding them um and it's also just great to think about how pedagogical materials could also be a way for um graduate students to think about how they might um you know intervene into the field right beyond the kind of more traditional like academic essays that you, know, you, you tend to do in seminars um these other forms of writing, thinking, um, can, can be ways to kind of expand how we think about graduate education to you. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, like, so we kind of talked about maybe future uh, directions already. And I'm thinking about how your students are taking these lesson plans, but maybe we can reflect back and think about um, the challenges that we face uh, in producing these materials. Yeah, so I can first jump in by saying that uh, we had to keep reflecting on our goal uh, throughout this process of collaboration. Um, since we uh, were exploring East Asia's importance to the self-making of the Anglophone world, or maybe um, to today's Victorian studies, uh, we as a group were keenly aware that this may risk falling into some kind of academic imperialism. Um, and we know that even uh, the bilateral or maybe the multilateral trans-imperial networks or trans-imperiality might just incorporate uh, the East Asian outliers in Victorian studies expansion. Um, or it might instead keep, uh, just like keep on disciplining East Asian studies rather than Victorian studies itself. So we also need to deal with the challenges uh, brought up by the framework of undisciplining. Um, and I know uh, Y.E., Jessica, and Hangji can talk more about how we deal with the historical framework, uh, terminology, and periodization, um, as well as the accessibility of materials. So I will just, just stop here. As Meilu mentioned, we had to grapple with connecting different disciplines and fields. And that also made us keenly aware um, of the need to broaden our historical knowledge beyond the conventional Eurocentric focus on um, so-called Victorian Britain. But at the same time, we could not assume that many Victorianists have this knowledge. So in order to help instructors who might not be familiar with the history of the region, we have provided a timeline of major historical events that interconnect to China, Japan, and Korea in the long 19th century. Furthermore, in uh, proposing this timeline, we are also proposing uh, a kind of reformulation of the long 19th century, 
So for the purposes of our project, the long 19th century actually begins with the opium trade in the early 19th century, and it stretches all the way to the end of the Japanese empire in 1945 and the Chinese Communist Revolution in 1949. Yeah, and I'll, I'll jump in here quickly. Um, and, and again, that is not to say that that is like a, a firm sense of periodization, but rather just kind of a framework we're using for this um, series of lesson plans. Um, again, it's all sort of in uh, open and, and sort of um, something that is meant to be kind of worked through and and, and taken on um, ex experimentally perhaps by, by um, the users. Um, one other thing that we were really concerned about, we kept coming back to throughout the whole process was this problem of terminology um, in addition to periodization. Of course, they're interlinked. Um, of course, we, we sort of, um, um, uh, we're preoccupied with the term Victorian. What do, what do we do with that? Is that the right word? Um, and also, importantly, the term East Asia. How do we describe the the region that we were talking about, writing about? Um, we we still um, have qualms, I think, about East Asia. We're we're using it with a sense of distance and, and self awareness. Um, and I think that's important to do with a lot of the terms that that we're using. Um, we're sort of inviting and opening up that discussion. Um, but what's very important to us, I think, is is not to silo off or or, or or suggest that East Asia is in isolation, because of course that is the tradition that in, in some older writings, um, it, a, a means in which it's been treated. Um, instead, we're emphasizing its interconnections, and that's why we we chose the title of, of trans-imperial networks to emphasize the deep interconnection in which um, these these countries and places in East Asia are interlinked with the world and, and with um, the very narrow concept that we usually have for Victorian studies. Um, interconnections, not just between um, London and, and say um, China, for example, but also with other regions, including of course, South Asia um, and interconnected too with that, that issue of the opium trade as Meng Lu works on in her lesson plan. Yeah, to take you behind the scenes a little bit in terms of, you know, the kinds of um, challenges we faced, I mean, in many ways, we started this project um, uh, because we wanted to redress the problem of the general absence of Asia in Victorian studies. But of course, you know, in putting together the lesson plan, we faced that same problem. Um, and I guess I would like to sort of highlight that we ran into problems of sort of language, translation, access. Um, uh, and our team kind of, you know, shows in small scale the general challenges of this field. Um, all of us on this team have some ability in an Asian language, which was really necessary to do a lot of these projects. But um, we faced, you know, additional kinds of problems. Like in, in in some of our projects, we felt that one Asian language was not really enough because there's so much happening interculturally. Or in my case, I'm fluent in Korean, but um, I have a lot of difficulty reading materials before, say, the early 20th century, because um, these, you know, at that point, Korean is using a lot of Hanta Chinese characters, um, et cetera. Uh, we also faced issues of translation. We were trying to provide materials in English, of course, that could be used in Victorian classrooms. So we wanted to be sure that everything we suggested was available in translation, but Sometimes um, we really we really couldn't find the the materials in English, and so in some I think some people on our team offered really brief translations that we ourselves did, or we also um, sometimes had to resort to referring our uh, you know our our readers to secondary sources on these materials. So if we found a source that was really important but not available in in English, we at least made available um, articles about those materials. So at least you could have. Uh, people could have access to that. Um, and then, of course, we also faced um, limitations of institutional access and budgets. Uh, often these fields are not, may not be a high priority for librari librarians. You know, we're all facing budget cuts everywhere. Um, and so we did have a lot of those kinds of issues. But I think everybody, we would all absolutely agree that um, we probably couldn't have done this project even 10 years ago. It was just the online, the absolute recent explosion of online availability of archives and materials. I, I think even just going through this myself, I learned, you know, about all these additional corners of the corners of the internet um, and sources for really interesting material that that we can do. So 
we're all thankful um, to online uh, uh, availability that helped our project. In my own lesson plan, to sort of take this limitation more personally, you know, Korea, my lesson plan turned out to be sort of making virtue out of a necessity. I mean, Korea is more or less entirely absent in Victorian literature. I haven't found any poetry or novels, uh, fiction that that actually makes explicit references to Korea. So in for this project, I ended up focusing on visual materials, visual culture. I use things like maps or um, travel narratives with photographs, uh, et cetera, of Korea in the 19th century. And even though it was, I did that because I didn't really have a choice, there was no other material. I think in some ways it really turned out to help this idea um, that Ray and Y.E. were talking about, about modularity or about, or about the ability to import um, our, our lesson ideas into other people's you know, classrooms or in different settings, right? Because it's so much easier to put uh, a map of Korea um, from the 17th century and to sort of use that as a touchstone or a discussion point or to look at photographs or I have one section on possible connections between Queen Victoria and Queen Min. These become, you know, I sort of, of necessity had to create these visual and other points of contact that make, um, that bring alive this, this relationship. And so uh, my own lesson plan is an example of how to try to navigate the limitations of availability, language access to produce modules that may be uh, very usable across different classrooms. Yeah, I mean, I love that idea, right? It's like through these limitations that we really had to innovate. Um, and I'll say like just this conversation about all the challenges that we face and all the discussions that we had um, to really create these lesson plans in this very intentional way is just kind of reminding me of like how much I learned through this process, right? Like I didn't create a lesson plan myself, right? I was kind of, um, I guess like the UBC organizer on the team. Um, and, you know, I, yes, I had the initial idea, but it was really just an idea. And I just had no idea um, what could come out of that just because like my own research has traditionally been in very canonical, right? Um, on very canonical literature. And so it's really been just such an eye-opening process kind of to learn from you guys and just to have these conversations. Um, so I'd love to hear from, from you all, you know, what did you gain from this collaboration? Um, you know, how might our collaboration maybe even um, provide a different kind of intellectual model um, than the other kind of collaborative models that are available to us? Yeah, I, I can speak to this because I think we all agreed, you know, this is one of the most rewarding, easiest collaborations I think most of us have actually um, been a part of. Uh, and that's just because a lot of our work is kind of rooted in who we specifically are, our specific scholarly identities, uh, where we teach from, what our backgrounds include. Um, at the time when we were beginning this collaboration, three of us, you know, Yi, Hyunji, Jessica, were teaching in East Asia. Yi is in Japan, Hyunji is in Korea. Jessica was at Hong Kong at the time. And this is a multi-year project, so she's since moved too as well. So, um, you know, we had a really good opportunity to to kind of, you know, be comfortable with each other, be flexible with each other because of just practical needs that we all had. Um, from a matter of practicality, we had to work across international deadlines. We all have very different academic schedules. So while some of us might be just beginning a semester, some of us are in the middle of exam period and furiously grading. Um, uh, you know, our board, some of our borders were closed. We all had very limited energy <laughs> and funding and time, time, time was always on our mind. Um, it would have been great to be able to meet at a conference and sit down and work through some of these ideas together in person. But how can you do that when your country isn't allowing people easy ways to fly out or your university isn't funding international conferences or your school semester dates don't line up so you can travel or do projects at the same time? So I think this really taught us, you know, we can work together easily through Zoom even um, uh, in this way and just give each other the space and the grace that we kind of need sometimes, you know, when there's just a pandemic and everything else um, in the world kind of 
challenging our, our attentions and our time. So it was really rewarding to work together against and outside our usual academic timelines and mindsets. And it's rare to be able to work with so many brilliant women who have the same shared background. So I, I said, um, you know, we, we did a panel about uh, our work together too for um, NAVSA for the North American Victorian Studies Association. And I said, it was kind of like meeting up with a childhood friend that you had like grown up, you had like parallel lives or something. And it really did feel like that. Yeah, and um, I guess on that note, um, maybe we can end on, you know, where do we go from here as a group, as a field, if anyone wants to pick up on that. Um, yeah, so I, I can jump in to say something about what we can go from here as a field. Um, I think what is clear, uh, is that we are not using East Asia to save Victorian studies, right? Uh, what we are really interested in here is um, how talking about or teaching East Asia in Victorian studies can create a space for other scholarly fields to intersect. Um, in the lesson plans, um, we feel that Victorian studies is a conduit uh, for us to explore the um, intimacies, for example, between uh, Asian diaspora studies and black studies um, in Jessica's lesson plan between transnational studies and uh, visual culture uh, in Hanji's lesson plan. And my own lesson plan touches on the uh, intersection of empire studies, uh, medical humanities, and environmental humanities. Um, and apart from that, we are not only looking at how uh, the East Asian others were represented, um, but also asking how they wrote back and how their narratives of literary theories provincialized uh, the Anglophone world and um, even problematized uh, Eurocentrism. So the lesson plan cluster uh, includes concrete case studies for us to think about how to um, undiscipline Victorian studies. Um, and we also hope our that our discussions of um, multilingualism, trans-imperial aesthetic forms, and uh, East Asian literary critical interventions in the lesson plans um, can help Victorian studies as a field to rethink the hegemony um, of Western theory and um, uh, scholarship. Yeah, I'd like to sort of jump in on, and sort of talk more personally about maybe where we as this group might be able to go. I mean, I want to sort of go back to what Ray was saying about how we really just, you know, interacted so well. I guess probably in this group, I've been teaching in Asia the longest of, of any of us. And for a really long time, I've been really struggling with this question. I've always felt that my location should inform my scholarship, that I should be writing articles on Dickens that reflect the fact that I live in Seoul and not New York or London or Chicago or something. And you know, honestly, it, it hasn't always been possible. I mean, sometimes that can be done and sometimes it just can't. Um, and I think in part I've been doing, I mean, I'm completely trained as a Victorianist, but I've been doing some work in Asian American or contemporary Korean culture as a way to sort of approach this question of location and how to make available of um, sort of how to produce a body of scholarship for myself that reflects the fact that I'm a Korea-based scholar. Um, and in some ways in Victorian studies, I've been thinking about this for a while, but uh, it has sometimes been kind of, you know, frustrating or unclear where I could go. And I feel like this group was a catalyst that made like, you know, all these thoughts that had been scattered for a while just like really came together with this group. And I'm really, really excited and really thankful um, and, and happy that we were able to be um, to come together, or as, as sort of why he was able to find me, you know, <laughs> I feel found in a very happy and, and included way. Um, and, and I want to emphasize the, the kind of uh, camaraderie that we, we really felt. Um, the pandemic could, I mean, we worked together for what, a span of about two years, pretty much exactly through the pandemic. And I think these were the most happy and familiar rectangles that I that I met, right? I mean, we spent a lot of time on Zoom. Not all of it, not all of it, um, so happy. But you know, we were really happy to see each other. And I think, especially as this project was 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 winding down, um, 
uh, at the end, I mean, I think when we met a couple of weeks ago to put you, I think in some ways we're doing this Zoom cast because we don't want to let go of each other. And when we met a couple of weeks ago to like talk about how we're going to do this Zoom cast, we were like, oh my gosh, we're so excited to see each other after we hadn't seen each other um, for a couple months. And I, I, I think the um, what's been really great is that we've supported each other on a personal level and we've seen each other grow and develop. Meng Lu moved jobs across the country. Jessica moved continents, you know, and and um, we're able to cheer and and Ye just got her book <laughs> accepted. And, you know, we're able to cheer each other on as we move forward in our careers because none of us are, are standing still. We're all moving ahead. And um, it's, it's just been really Really excited. We're we're hoping to do some more collaborative work. We still need to talk about this. We might guest edit a journal issue. Maybe we'll put a put together a book collection, or maybe we'll move into a more public or less academic um, forum. We do think that you know issues of um, Asian hate, etc. A lot of the the motivation that Sophia started with uh, that she mentioned to circle back to the beginning of our Zoomcast. You know, I mean, we've done a little part, but it's not. We haven't solved. We haven't solved the world. Things are still ongoing. These issues um, continue, and so uh, we would. Um, I don't know. I feel like we found this space of uh, friendly um, uh, collaboration, and hopefully, we can find uh, more ways to continue that going forward. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a great place to end, right? Like, we loved working together. We would love to continue working together. Um, whoever's listening if you have any thoughts and, and want to send your ideas our way we're happy to to chat um and so yeah i think that's our time uh thank you to those who are listening who are watching uh, and we'll catch you on another zoom cast